This episode of the Capsule in Conversation is brought to you by Harrogate Spring Water. Famous for its waters since 1571, Harrogate is Britain's premium natural source water. Hello all, I hope you're all well and have had a really fabulous week. Spooky season is now officially upon us with Halloween just around the corner, but we've got no frights today. Just a man who knows everything there is to know about food. With over 26 years in the nutrition and wellness industry, 18 books, a spot on ITV's Eat Shop Save as their resident nutrition specialist, sell out workshops and business programs, and as the founder of the Culinary Medicine College, I would say we're in pretty good hands with the brilliant Dale Pinnock. Hi, Dale. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. Can I just say that that list was not even half of the things that you've (laughs) achieved. I mean, I didn't even get to like all of your qualifications or anything of that, but which you've had the most incredible career and your breadth of work is huge. But, you know, where did your passion really for food and for nutrition really begin? Well, Food. I mean, kind of all of my life, really. I've always just been like uh, an enthusiastic <laughs> eater or a gannet. As we, uh, um, but in terms of the nutritional side of things, like like most people that find nutrition, I kind of found it due to my own health challenges. I mean, I got into it when I was fifteen. Not many people, when they're fifteen year old, fifteen years old, are like, yeah, I want to study broccoli and colons. Do you know what I mean? They don't kind of like think that way. So it's usually when people actually are struggling with their health and they realize how powerful nutrition is as a, as a modality as they're kind of going through it, they tend to be drawn to it. So that was the case for me. For, for me, it was acne. So from the age of about 10 or 11, it was the summer of leaving primary school to go up to secondary school, that time in your life when you just start to become conscious of yourself in relation to your peers I looked like I'd been shot in the face with a blunderbuss. I started breaking out. It looked awful. And I went to so many different um, different doctors and dermatologists and had every manner of lotion and potion. And nothing really worked. Nothing really made that much of a difference. Got to 15 years old, sat around at my friend's house one night, feeling sorry for myself, moping about how bad my skin looked. And um, his, his mum lent me this book. And it was a book called Fit for Life by Harvey Diamond, which is like a kind of 80s fad diet type thing. Um, but it was my first introduction to the concept of nutritional medicine, really. She gave me this book and she was like, look, unless you change what's going on on the inside, nothing's going to change on the outside. And obviously, as a 15-year-old boy, I was like, oh, yeah, whatever. Um, but, you know, what if someone would have told me to run out in the garden at midnight wrapped in tinfoil and it would have worked, I, I would have tried it. So I was, I was game for anything. I read this thing cover to cover in a weekend and boom, there was like that light bulb moment that actually made me realize that we could actively engage in our own healthcare. I realized it wasn't a passive process. There's things that we can do every single day that can influence our state of health. And that was it. I was I was kind of hooked. I um, I read over a thousand books. I, I tried every conceivable diet you could imagine, um, raw food diets, macrobiotic diets, um, Ayurvedic approaches to eating, all sorts, all sorts. Um, I was vegan for 20 years, all of this kind of stuff. And nothing really had grabbed me in the same way as nutrition did. So yeah, I ended up studying it, did my first degree in human nutrition, second degree in herbal medicine. Not that I wanted to be a herbalist. I just wanted to study more about plant biochemistry and the influence on the body. And then went into clinical practice for a few years, then went on to do a a master's degree in nutritional medicine at Surrey and cooking all of my life. So it just seemed like the most obvious delivery system for the information was the preparation of food. So rather than just kind of standing up and, and give it a, a PowerPoint presentation saying, yeah, eat more of this and less of that, which is as dull as dishwater. If you actually put it in some kind of practical framework, it's like, right, this is the science. This is what it's all about. This is what breakfast, lunch, and dinner looks like. We're in that context. You've got cardiovascular disease. You need to make these changes for this reason. This is what breakfast looks like. This is how you incorporate that into your lunch. Da, da, da. Putting it into that kind of framework makes it practical, makes it applicable, makes it something that people can actually start to use and action straight away. And like for food as medicine, you know, at the minute we're just about, well, we're just not about to, we're kind of on the precipice of, we've had this horrendous mental health kind of epidemic and we've been through the pandemic and now going forward, you know, people are really worried about their mental health. But, you know, you've talked a lot before about how you can use food to kind of combat quite a few mental health issues. I mean, things like, 
amino acids you know yeah. with to help with your mental health just you know if you could just kind yes. of talk me through that okay so amino acids obviously these mo- most of us know amino acids as being like the building blocks of protein all the proteins in our body are made out of differing sequences of amino acids put together it's like a string of these of these different things different different amino acid sequences will give rise to different proteins but they do so much more than that. They can be the precursors for so many other kind of substances and compounds in our body. In the context of mental health, there is um, probably the most well-known is the amino acid tryptophan. Now, tryptophan is the precursor to serotonin. So many of us, I should imagine, would have become aware of serotonin because of the amount of talk around mental health now and a lot more people getting into the science and that kind of stuff we would have heard of serotonin serotonin in the brain and this is something that i'll come on to in a minute uh, in the brain actually is involved in elevating mood and making us feel happier and more content and connected tryptophan will get converted over into 5-hydroxy tryptophan and then converted over into serotonin in the right circumstances. Now, um, usually, what I, you know, when I when I'm talking about um, serotonin and and tryptophan and stuff, usually it's in the context of regulating sleep. Because one of the other things that serotonin does is when we when our eyes detect dark, when we actually realise that it's darkness, serotonin will convert over into melatonin. Okay, and melatonin kind of it sets the clock. It gets us to sleep and it keeps us asleep. Okay, so I often say to people, right, you can have like a a pre bedtime snack of something like a, a a turkey open sandwich or a tuna open sandwich. So foods like turkey, tuna, peanut butter, bananas, they're all rich sources of tryptophan. If you have a rich source of tryptophan with a little bit of carbohydrate, you will actually get it where it needs to go to do its job because. One of the things that, that you need to actually get kind of catapult tryptophan into the brain is just a little rise in blood glucose. You need a little insulin spike, which you'll get from the carbohydrate. You don't want a huge flood of it so that you're kind of overly stimulated and struggling to sleep. But this gentle rise in blood sugar will actually kind of catapult the tryptophan across the blood-brain barrier where it can actually get into, you know, into the brain and do its thing. So I would say to people, like a slice of multigrain bread with like some tuna mayo and some spinach or something like that that can be a pre-bedtime snack, maybe an hour before bed. And that will elevate levels of serotonin. And when you actually kind of turn the lights out and get into sleep mode, that will convert into melatonin and off you drift. So that's that's the one that most people are aware of. But then there's another one called DL DL-phenylalanine. <clears throat> Put my teeth in. And that's um, that's that's a really good one for actually increasing um, levels of, of uh, dopamine in the brain. And this has been a really, really important one for things like um, therapies with addiction. So it's been been studied a lot with um, with drug addiction, with alcohol addiction, even gambling addiction. Like Because all, all addictions really, I mean, you, you take the substance, you take the substance out of the equation and... All addictions tend to be built around that dopamine-seeking response, okay? People looking for the dopamine hit. Now, there's a, have you ever come across the work of Johan Hari? No. Yeah, he's, he's written some, oh my God, like he will blow your mind. He's one of the most fantastic beings on this earth. He really is. He's, he's written two incredible books. One's called Lost Connections, which is about depression. And the other one's called Chasing the Scream, which is about um, addiction. And... He uses a really, really interesting um, example because we, we're always led to believe that the thing that causes addiction is is the the substance itself. Okay, like you know what co- what what causes alcohol addiction? Well, what? it's alcohol, isn't it? Come on, it's a bit of a no brainer. Well, here's the thing: he gave the example of like how many people have been into hospital and like that you know, had maybe some surgery or some kind of acute trauma, and they're given morphine. Morphine is the purest form of heroin you could ever get. It is the best of the best of the best. And they can be given that for days and days and days. Do they leave hospital and try and score from a dealer down a back alley? They don't. They don't come out a junkie. So if it was just the substance, then they would. They would be, you know, they would have to like be weaned off of it. But they're not. It's a certain circumstances it's a certain set of circumstances and usually it's it's some kind of disconnect or some kind of 
wanting to escape the life that you're in or escape the emotional state that you're in that can drive that that kind of behavior and a lot of that is based on brain chemistry and one of the things that will reinforce that 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 seeking of that kind of pleasure or dare i say it numbing behavior and i say this as someone that's been down that road right okay you know some people are aware of that but it's you know it is what it is um dopamine will actually kind of force you to seek that reward behavior now in 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 certain situations with things like addiction certainly when there's been like a a lot of trauma your brain kind of wants to escape into a safe place where it's not feeling the effects of that trauma and sometimes that safe place can be right let's completely numb it with just getting hammered or let's numb it by you know seeking out strange behaviors and it's that dopamine that's kind of driving you to do that because it's it's like look if you if you go get this reward you're going to start to feel good you're going to escape these things that are actually causing you harm and, and like causing you problems mentally and emotionally so people that are kind of real dopamine seekers so people that have this you know just from being hedonists through to people that are in like the full blown throes of addiction it's dopamine that's driving it. DL phenyl alanine supplements have been shown to raise dopamine without having to go and seek that behavior. So they start to get the dopamine fix. They start to satisfy the dopamine pathway without having to indulge in the damaging behaviors. And when used alongside, like, you know, the right types of counseling and other kinds of therapies, it can be a really, really valuable tool for actually kind of rewiring all the pathways that are driving that that behavior in the first place. So it's fascinating stuff. So you would you kind of say then for somebody who's, you know, who's kind of possibly going down that road but actually got to a point where they they know they need to work on it they know they've not got to so far down the line for certain foods and then take these supplements um as a a, an an add-on or are they in certain foods you know where where can where could you get this 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 needs to be taken as a supplement absolutely needs to be taken as a as a supplement and really yeah i mean it's one of those things where it is part of the picture it is part of the picture and it has to be taken with like a great big helping of honesty as well and and self-awareness and self-reflection but one you know if if you if you know that you need to get a bit of a bit of a curb on things then it's a good place to start because it can really take the edge off off cravings that's what i'm thinking you know if yeah. somebody's know it noticing already like they might be just drinking a bit too much or they might be but yet then they come in from work and they feel a bit like oh I just, yeah. I need, I need this. Yeah. If, if they know and they're, they're like you said, self-awareness, you know, which many people, I think now we're opening the conversation around mental health. Now we're yeah, talking about these things. It's not such a scary thing to admit. It's not yeah. such a scary thing to say, actually, I might be doing this just a bit too much. So what can I do to kind of help me, like, as you said, curb the craving? Yeah. So if someone can, I mean, if you can recommend like, at the end where people could maybe find these supplements that would be amazing sure absolutely i mean you get this in any health food store this is the thing just go to go to a good health food store and uh you know they'll point you in the right direction i've heard it a lot you know about the ketogenic diet yes is that better for cognitive function or is that a myth because there's so many food myths <laughs> right well it, it depends on context i mean the, right. the brain runs very effectively on on ketone bodies and i have to admit i i i tend to veer towards the 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 sort of keto low carb kind of thing myself i certainly find that if i if i raise my carb intake too much then i just get brain fog and you know the normal kind of firing that i have just disappears whereas if i'm more kind of fueled on fat then it's it's like a really well-oiled machine i think it's great so there's a lot of people anecdotally Mm. report it as being something that improves performance but where there is an evidence base and this is the really fascinating thing in this context is in alzheimer's oh wow yeah now alzheimer's is sometimes called i mean you know it's just like daft kind of nicknames but it's sometimes called type 3 diabetes Mm. because when you get amyloid plaque formation so the little areas of plaque that damage bundles of neurons within the brain it causes those brains to all those neurons. <laughs> it causes those neurons to almost become um, 
almost become diabetic. It means that they can't use glucose effectively. So it's not that the the neuron is dead. It's that it can't use its normal fuel source particularly effectively because of the influence that the amyloid plaque is having on it. It's stopping it utilizing glucose. However, it can they can still use ketone bodies absolutely perfectly when there is amyloid plaque present. And there's been a lot of trials now that have got people onto a very strict keto diet, which is really bloody difficult to do in day-to-day mm. life. So it has to be done in, in clinical environments onto a true ketogenic diet. And it's almost like they've got their, their loved ones back. It's oh. like, it's literally like nothing has ever happened to them. And it's not, to, and it's a simple reason that it's just the brain has an alternative fuel source. And it's, you know, it's early days, but the conversations being had, I mean, a lot of the uh, Alzheimer's organizations, there's data on their websites about the research that's ongoing. And certainly in many cases, for people that can actually get into the state of nutritional ketosis, then they're they're having really, really incredible results. And I'm actually, I mean, hopefully, I mean, myself and, you know, you know, Tanya Franks. Yes. Yeah. So we've, we've been talking about actually doing a documentary on this because it's something that's, you know, a mission that's, that's personal to her as well. And it's the research is out there and the information is out there. And it's something that we're, that we're kind of putting our heads together on because this conversation needs to be had that, okay, there is, I don't think anyone's aware of anything you can do to, to stop it or mm. to slow it down or to reverse it, but if someone's in that situation, can you bring something in that actually enables that area of the brain to start functioning in a similar way again because it's using a different fuel? If that's the case, that's enormous. That's absolutely enormous. It is, absolutely. And I think, like we were just saying then, the myths around these diets and food groups and all of this, it kind of gets in the way of all the important stuff, yes, like what you're saying there. You know, for, for me, I'm slightly wary of like ketogenic because I've all, I'm that kid from the 90s that, like I said before, was, you know, on the Atkins diet, which right. to be honest was, you know, that didn't go down very well. You know, lots of very skinny people walking around just living on fats and then people having heart attacks and whatnot else. And, and yeah. it, for me, it's, I'm like, oh, isn't it just a version of that? That's me just being the everyday person. It's not a million miles from it. Is so then because this is the thing is like then we do we get into the thing where carbs are the enemy or you know what's what what should we do? Uh, uh, yeah, this, is, <laughs> this, is, this is a whole other can of worms. All honesty, I mean, it, the thing is with 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 nutrition, it has to re a lot of the time it's person centered. I mean, I, I I hate the phrase, you know, you often hear people say, well, what what might work for one person might not work. I, yeah. I hate that kind of thinking because it's like, well, look, there's certain things that really are a given for all of us. But then we've also got our genetic nuances as well that need to be taken into consideration. Mm. And most outcomes of nutritional intervention are gene-environment interactions. It's where someone's unique genetics and their diet actually meet in the middle Mm. and the result is created. So with... um, With things like carbohydrates, it depends on how metabolically healthy you are. Right. Okay. So most of the people that are walking around um, with okay, let's let's right let's be really frank about a, a few things. Right. Pre COVID, what were the things that were actually really burdening our healthcare system? It was obesity, type two diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and certain mm-hmm. types of cancers, all of which are linked to metabolic syndrome. When I say only only certain cancers linked to metabolic syndrome, by the way, you know, little caveat just in case, yeah. you know, Twitter, listen, pay attention. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, metabolic syndrome. This is where you get people that that have one, one, two, three of these signs of poor metabolic health. They're carrying abdominal mm. additional weight. They're blood sugar. So you're looking at something like their HbA1c, which is an actual measure of blood sugar over the six to eight weeks. People that have um, raised HbA1c, which means that their blood glucose is often very, very high. They tend to have raised blood pressure and raised uh, blood lipids like triglycerides and LDL cholesterol as well. People that are in that picture, they're the people that really will benefit from raining the carbohydrates back in for a little while because of the impact that carbs have on some key hormones, <clears throat> particularly insulin. So when, when, we can, when we consume a carbohydrate, our blood glucose goes up relatively quickly. 
uh, depending on the type of carbohydrate. And the body responds to that by releasing the hormone insulin. Insulin will bind to a insulin receptor on our cells. Then like a little glucose transporter opens on the cells and the cells given the signal that there's some additional glucose available. Can you take it up and turn it into ATP, adenosine triphosphate, which is the fuel source that our cells run on? Can you take this up, convert it into fuel and get it out of the way? Cells like, yeah, not a problem. We'll do that. We'll do that. That's good. That's a good thing. So it starts to take in this additional glucose. And most of the time, for most of us that, that don't have these kind of like metabolic health issues, that's totally fine. It gets blood sugar back down into a normal range. Everything's great. However, if you're constantly pushing blood sugar up, so, you know, I mean, obviously for the people that are metabolically unhealthy, this is going on even, even with a reasonably healthy diet. Mm. Um Cells have a cutoff point in regards to how much glucose they can take in in one sitting. Okay, so if blood sugar has been absolutely carpet bombed, so this is—I mean, let's have a look at let's have a look at this as, as an example, right? How normal is it in when you look at British eating habits? How normal is it for someone to have a bowl of cereal and a slice of toast for breakfast? Then maybe a sandwich and a packet of crisps for lunch, and then maybe you know loads of spuds or pasta or whatever in the evening. Not demonizing any of those foods, not saying any of those foods are bad. The pattern of consumption is the problem because all of those will have a lot of glucose in them and they liberate that glucose very, very rapidly. So what you're doing is creating an environment where blood sugar is constantly being push, pushed up. When that happens, obviously that first response that I talked about, the insulin being released and the cells taking up the glucose, that happens first. But cells have got a cutoff point. They can only take up so much glucose in one sitting mm. for the simple reason that any excess has the potential to cause extreme damage within the cell. It can cause like a glucotoxicity. It can oxidize. It can damage DNA. It can damage some of the organelles and key structures within the cell. So once they've got enough that they can cope with, they shut the doors. When they shut the doors, if blood glucose is still high, which it probably will be after eating those kinds of mm -hmm. foods, then the next thing that happens is we will convert some of it into something called glycogen. And glycogen is a storage form of glucose that is stored in skeletal muscle and also in the liver. But we don't store much of it. We've just got a little bit there as like an emergency ration. So we'll kind of top up those stores. Then if it's still high, which it probably will be, it's still going to be dealt with because blood sugar that's too high or too low are both potentially life-threatening states. So the body's very, very effective at finding lots of different ways to remedy the situation. Mm. So once those first two um, points of utilization have been saturated, the excess that's left will get shuttled to the liver and then will get converted over into something called triacylglycerol, otherwise known as triglycerides. Triglycerides, they're a fatty substance that basically can be stored for a rainy day. Now, this stuff is hardwired into our DNA, right? You think about it during like, the biggest chunk of human evolution. We were hunter-gatherers. We were living on, you know, when we, when we were kind of living on the Serengeti or whatever, we had times <laughs> of feast and famine. We had times where food was abundant and we could gorge ourselves and we could store that energy. And then we had times where, where um, food was very, very scarce and especially in like winter seasons. Mm. And we'd use the stores. We can actually use the stores more effectively and we'd be in that constant state of flux. We're not in a state of flux anymore. We're in a state of absolute abundance. <sighs> Famine yeah. is, a, you know, is, is a distant memory. So all of this stuff is hardwired in us. So it, it's natural that it happens. Anyway, when we start producing all, the, all, this, um, all these triglycerides, they get stored and they get stored in the fat tissue. So obviously that's one of the things that causes you to, to, to gain a little bit of weight, especially around the middle, because that's the closest place for the liver to dump it. But it's got to get there via the circulation. So one, you start to put on a little bit of weight. Two, those fats going around in your circ circulation can oxidize. And when they oxidize, they can cause damage to the blood vessels. When they cause damage to the blood vessels, that is the beginning stage of cardiovascular disease, of plaque formation. So you've increased your risk of heart disease and you're putting on weight. Now, if this is happening every single day, every single day, mm. then several things start to happen. I mean, firstly, obviously you start to put on weight and, and your cardiovascular health is taking a hit. But the receptor for insulin starts to smell a rat because you're constantly like having all these insulin spikes. The insulin receptor's like, yeah, chaps, I think, uh, I think insulin's lost its shit. I think it just doesn't know what's <laughs> going on. Ignore him. Ignore him. He doesn't know what the hell he's oh, talking about. You no. get insulin receptor down regulation, okay? And at that stage, we get into the state that's called insulin resistance, Okay, so even though we're producing loads more, loads of insulin, 
the insulin receptor isn't listening anymore. So the cells aren't taking up as much glucose. And our glycogen stores are full. So what happens? We start putting on more weight. We start getting even more severe uh, cardiovascular risk. But also, because there is just so much glucose present, we start to get glucose glucotoxicity on other organs like the pancreas. And lo and behold, we have type 2 diabetes. So these three things, that, that, that weight gain, that increase in cardiovascular risk, and that type 2 diabetes risk are all related to the macronutrient composition of our diet. And this kind of happened from... I mean, it was the late 70s in America mm. and the early 80s in the UK. We started getting all these public health messages that saturated fat was the devil. That's going to kill you. So you need to reduce that from your diet and instead build your diet around healthy, starchy carbohydrates and the heart healthy vegetable oils. And we kind of took that a little bit <laughs> too far. So now the amount of carbohydrate that's in our diet is drastically beyond what most of us can deal with. Now, for people that are already in that state, that already have some of those problems, I would say get onto a low carb diet and do it, do it, do it well. Combine that with, you know, good resistance exercise and list cardio and that kind of stuff, and you can really start to reverse the picture. Once you're in better health again, particularly if you're physically active, then you can start to bring the the carbohydrates back in. Now, athletes are the opposite end of the thing. Most of those are just going to crash and burn on a low carbohydrate diet, but yeah. they're so much more primed to being able to deal with that excess glucose. I mean, you think about even the amount of calories that they're burning at rest, the energy requirements they have even at rest because of like lean muscle mass and all that kind of thing. That completely changes the game in terms of what their ideal diet needs to look like. So this is, this is where it gets tricky in terms of giving this like absolute blanket advice. For most of us, in this country, I would say a low glycemic diet is the way to go. And that doesn't mean cutting out carbs. What that means is when you look at your plate, one half of your plate should be the non-starchy vegetables. So think greens, broccoli, courgettes, onions, all of that kind of stuff. Mm. The low carbohydrate, nutrient dense vegetables. And then the other half of your plate, you can kind of split into two. In one bit, a palm sized portion of a slow burning carbohydrate. So think brown rice, pearl barley, quinoa, maybe a little bit of butternut squash, something like mm. that. Something that even though it's a carbohydrate, it takes a lot of digestive effort to actually liberate the glucose because of the amount of fiber that's in there. Okay. So these high fiber carbohydrate staples. Yeah. When you kind of put them like next to each other, like numerically, they contain the same amount of carbohydrate, but because of the fiber that's in there, the fiber makes it much harder for that glucose to actually be liberated during digestion. So what that means is that blood sugar is drip fed instead of carpet bond. And because mm. it's drip fed and it just raises gently, the cells can take it up and they can use it as energy. And it's like a constant flux in there. One, your energy levels are going to stay stabilize and you're going to feel much better. But all of those physiological responses that I spoke about that can be potentially damaging are completely negated. They're, they're out of the window. And then also the other the, the other oh, the other missing part on the plate is a portion of a good healthy protein. It doesn't matter if you're if you're like a meat eater or plant based. If you're plant based, have some tofu or some beans or whatever. If you're a meat eater, like some, you know, chicken or fish or whatever, that kind of meal composition that's creating a diet that doesn't cause the blood sugar peaks and troughs. It doesn't mean you're cutting out any food groups, and it means that you're building your diet around whole foods. It's ticking all of the right boxes. The thing is, like what you've just said then, I mean, I'm I'm so guilty of this. I'm My diet is always has been kind of very carb heavy from being a kid. As you said, cereals, toast, jacket potatoes, um, chips with things. And I mean, I'm quite slim. I'm slender. But I'm noticing now as I'm getting towards like my 40s, there's the odd pound kind of creeping in. Like and you get past your 40s. I know. Well, this it is the thing. It's like, this is what I mean. Is and, and I know a lot of my friends are feeling the same. Now, my mum is getting towards her 60s and she's like, it's this middle section. It's this middle section. I don't know what to do about it. And I've obviously said, you know, it's to do with our metabolic rate, clearly. It's like, it's definitely that. And, and so you do have to take these things into consideration. But what I see a lot of people doing is then going, well, I'll just count my calories instead. Uh, and, uh, and you see and, and as we get older i think that it's not you do have calories, to bear with mind this other stuff completely meaningless completely nonsensical they are the they are the most useless thing to actually base you know to to, to measure the adequacy of your diet on 
I mean, you know, they've got some relevance when you look at like sort of energy output when you're doing a workout or something mm. like that. But in terms of weight management, absolutely meaningless, absolutely meaningless for several reasons. I mean, all of the things that we just spoke about, fat, fat tissue is a tissue and all tissues in the body are regulated by hormones and by a hormonal environment. Okay, so that's the first thing. A <clears throat> hundred calories of chocolate, a hundred calories of broccoli, and a hundred calories of butter are going to have very, very, very different hormonal and biological impacts on your body. We are not a combustion engine. We are a bi- biological system, a biological system that absorbs, converts, partitions, utilizes things by choice. It can choose how it does things and what it does with things. You know, we're not a straight combustion engine that is energy in, energy out. Anyone, anyone that really believes that, and all these, you know, these bl- bloody PTs on Instagram, <laughs> where, they're like, it's all about carry deficits. Like, go and in study. Actually, go and get an education and realize how complicated this shears is and then we can have a conversation because it is hellishly complex if you really want to go into like all of the nuances of of human metabolism but so the first thing all calories are not equal it depends on like the impact they have on all of those other systems i mean there was a a great thing done by sam felton actually and they they um, documented it in the daily mail he's like right i'm gonna do an experiment i'm gonna add an additional five thousand calories a day to my diet and by the, you know, by the these laws that everyone seems to go by, I should be putting on an absolute shed load of weight. But he was like, I will, I, I know that the thing that has the lowest impact on blood glucose and insulin and all of those pathways is fat. So I'm going to add an additional five thousand calories of fat a day to my diet, which he did. He lost weight. Oh my god! This he is what he I didn't mean. Cha- yeah, he didn't change like his physical activity. He didn't change anything else. The only variable was this additional five thousand calories, and he was absolutely shredded to bits. Um, this is the thing. So, not all calories are equal in terms of their hormonal um, expression. Secondly, how many people know how a calorie is measured? Okay, a calorie is measured in a contraption called a bomb calorimeter, which is a pressurized airtight container within a vat of water. And one calorie is like, you know, the the amount of energy it takes to heat one, you know, one gram of water by one degree. When that happens, that food sample that's in the bomb calorimeter is actually burnt to an ash. So when you get when when you see it, it's just an ash that's left over. Now, ash has never come out of my backside, right? <laughs> we aren't a combustion engine. You can see clearly that there's components of the food that we eat that are left behind. When you burn it to ash, you release all of the energy in all of the chemical bonds that are holding that structure together. That doesn't happen in the digestive tract. So already the number that you see on the label and the amount of energy that the body can actually glean from that food are two completely different scenarios. You know, we look, we're looking at two things that don't, that aren't even paired. They don't even match. They don't even make sense because we, you know, we know that there are things like um, certain fibers that that come out the other end intact. We know there's components of our food that don't fully break, break down Mm. the energy in the bonds that are holding those structures together, haven't been liberated, but they have in the bomb calorimeter. So already you you can see yeah you can see that the, the two values don't match up so that's another thing <clears throat> but then also it's no blooming way to live either I mean, if you're constantly calculating things and measuring things it's a miserable existence whereas if you just understand how to put together a good healthy diet that's going to have the best possible effect upon your physiology and not cause all of these kind of issues as simple as look at your plate, where's your protein? Where's your slow burning carb? Where's your abundance of non-starchy veg? Oh, that was easy. Done. Job done. You could have like a massive salad with a jacket potato and tuna on it. Bam, done. That ticks all the boxes. That's that's it done. You know, you can you it's that simple. It's that simple. Understanding what it looks like visually and how to put it together. I think as well, the other thing is though is that we've got very lazy and like with convenience, yeah. like, you know, it's just that, as you just said then, is like it's so easy to do. But the fact that the jacket potato would probably take a little while for some people, they want that because of the culture that we live in, they want it instantly. They want yeah. it's, it's like Amazon, you know, I want it, I want it now, I want it this. They don't want to have to go to all the effort of the food prep. And and this is where it's spiraling out of control because as you said, you've said to me before, eat the food that your gran would eat. 
you know it yeah. just go back to basics like proper butter not yeah. these low fat whatever's they are but yeah. People are so consumed now by wanting everything quickly and conveniently that their because health is sold is, this idea. Yeah. I mean, well, there's, there's several things I've got to say to got to say to that. I mean, I mean, I think we're we're certainly in an environment now where people people are too gentle about certain things. It's like, <laughs> oh, I don't want to upset anyone. This is for me. It's like, listen, what's what's more inconvenient is being sick. Yes. Right. What's more convenient is realizing that you're not going to get to see your kids grow up because you're almost dead. What's inconvenient is feeling like absolute crap and dragging yourself through every day because you've got no energy just to function. Mm. It's like if you cannot use that as your motivation to change, fine, but don't complain about it. If you're not prepared to stand up and make a change, that's complete, you know, you crack on, do whatever you want. I, I couldn't be any more indifferent if I tried, but don't complain about it it's like you know these people that have these big dreams and do nothing about it it's mm. like well <laughs> serves you right and I, and I know that sounds really really harsh but someone's got to say it it's like look there's there, there is there is always a way for people to work towards change if they want to mm. and i understand that people are going through hell in terms of like you know their finances and all of that kind of insecurity if that if if you're in that position and this is this is me say, saying this to anyone listening if you're in that position where you're struggling with your finances, but you, you are committed to, to wanting to make healthier choices, hit me up, right? Mm. And I'll give you so many tips, so many tricks, how you can actually do this thing. I mean, I'll give you an example. Uh, a few years ago, I did a, a piece with ITV News where we were working with these two, two girls that were living in the YMCA in Croydon. Okay, their combined, I mean, between the two of these girls, their combined weekly budget for food was £15, okay? Oh. And they were reliant on like you know the frozen food outlets and stuff like that that was that was the only real choice that they had but they were running out well so they thought they were running out of money and not only were they having days where they they couldn't eat but at their age i mean i, th I think they were um 17 and 18 they couldn't have any kind of social life all of the things that are really significant when mm. you're that age they weren't able to to kind of participate in so they were they were they were in a really miserable situation, but they they kind of reached out because they knew that there must be a different way and they wanted to help other people that are in a similar situation. So I got there and, and started chatting to them and said, All right, okay, so how often do you do you, um, shop at Croydon Market? And they were like, what market? And this is like a blooming great market smack bang in the middle of Croydon. Yeah. And um, I said, right, okay, I want you to forget all of the supermarkets, forget all of those kind of places. Let's go and have a little wander around the market. We went around there. We got four carrier bags full of fresh ingredients for eight pound 96 i think it was that we spent went back to the went back to the ymca and we cooked up about 25 batches of this uh this curry that works out 60 pence a portion okay so we cooked up the batches put them in the freezer so they were able to stockpile mm. some of these healthy meals which meant as week on week they were starting to have more and more money spare so they were able to save a little bit. They were actually able to see their friends. They were able to do stuff and they were able to eat good food as well. My point is sometimes you just need to think outside the box a little bit, just be a little bit creative and see what you can do. Um, so, so that doesn't have to be the thing that stands in your way. It doesn't. Okay? And also as well, I think, you know, you've got to make the time. I think we're all time yes. starved. Like we're like, oh, emails, this, that, you know, even the other, it was like the other day when all the apps went down and everybody was suddenly like, well, what am I going to do? And actually yeah. it was a break. It was a really lovely break, like a breath of fresh air because you realize how much time is spent on this digital, social kind of these yeah. platforms, where most actually, of mine's automated now. Yeah, well, this I, is I, the I thought thing. I should do my nutting. Yeah, this is the thing. It's kind of like you have to kind of dedicate the time to do the prep because actually having that really um you know being able to have great nutrition will allow you to make better decisions will yes. allow you to get a better you know uh, concept around your own mental health to yeah. then do a better job so it's all kind of in a circular motion that you have 100%. to start at this point and as you say it's not you've got to put that first you've got to really remember yeah. that your health is wealth really a, a really useful thing, a useful tool. And, you know, I, I, I absolutely understand all this stuff. I've been working with um, 
people clinically for you know like 20 odd years so i understand the situation and one of the things that i will say to people is like when you feel that your commitment is starting to wane or if ever you kind of <clears throat> feel like it's becoming less of a priority right at the beginning when you're like right i'm going to make a change try and determine what is your why mm. right okay so for some people some people will like make the decision they go to the doctors just for a routine checkup and they find out that they're they're, they're two points away from a heart attack or you know there's maybe a shock diagnosis or one day they take a look in the mirror and think what the hell happened or whatever something usually shocks people into making that kind of decision or it's something that is associated with negative emotion that mm. makes them make that decision remember how that feels remember that negative feeling and use that as your rocket fuel okay make a note of how you felt in that situation make a note of how bad it felt and make sure that you've always got access to that fold it up and put it in your wallet whatever and if you feel like oh, i feel, feel like, oh, i'm not sticking to this read that mm. and that's your why and don't don't hide from that Use that as the thing that drives you to make positive change. That's your rocket fuel. That's like throwing petrol on a fire. That brings that fire back in your belly. It's like, I remember why I was doing this. Well, no, no, I'm not going to have that bloody takeaway. I'm going to actually like go and cook something. Or, you know, I'm going to find I'm going to find a way that I can, you know, afford to get more of this or less of that or whatever. You can make those decisions when you use those powerful emotions to your benefit. And that drive can help you move mountains. That I can guarantee. And that as well. And something else that you've talked about that I think is really important for people is the, if you make a slip up, that is not the end. You've got the opportunity no. to start yes. like the next day. Don't, yeah. you know, don't throw the towel in. It's kind meal. of like, yeah, the next yeah. meal. Okay. And and do, do, you know, just remember what the key principles are and just get back to it. You don't need to feel like you failed or you've not done this or, because exactly you haven't, you haven't yeah. not at all. It's, it's a journey and, you know, you're learning and everything else. And I think that's so important for people when they feel like, oh, well, what's the point? I failed at that. And then yeah. they step away from it. It's like, no, okay, that were, that meal didn't go quite the way you wanted it to go, but the next one can, and you yeah. move on and move forward and don't lose that motivation because it's so yes. important to stick to. Um, just before we finish up, there's one question I have to ask because I've had okay. this question so many times. Water retention, yes. especially for women. Yes. How do... Because ha- if there's... You're going to get people going, oh, it's water weight. Is it water weight? Is it not really water weight? Is it salt? Is it this? What can be causing All of these this? these things, like hormones can actually yeah. cause you to, to, to gain water weight. Um, usually it's sodium con- concentration within the body. Mm. So the, one of the easiest ways to do that is just drink more of it. Although, although this has got chlorophyll in it. That's why it's bright <laughs> green. But, um, but yeah, just, just drink more water and you can actually start to, to, to purge it a little bit. Because one of the things that will happen is like if... Um, if the actual concentration of certain minerals changes in your body, you will actually retain water to, to kind of dilute it a little bit. So there isn't too much of a concentration that can affect, um, you know, functioning of the nervous system and, and, and different organs in the body. So if you just drink more as, as kind of counterintuitive as that sounds, and you kind of, you know, when you like, you break the seal, if you've been drinking water all day, then all of a sudden you get to the point where you're like, it's literally like you feel like you're peeing every five minutes, yeah. get to that point, And that can actually help to, um r- reduce some of it sometimes i say it again raining in the carbs because you know i spoke about glycogen as being mm. a, a storage form that we store in the skeletal muscles and in the liver glycogen bonds three to four times its own weight of water it actually binds onto it so once you start to use up glycogen stores the water that's holding onto is purged as well so that's often why people that go on these crash diets they have this dramatic loss within like the first week that's yeah. the water weight going that's the the glycogen being used up and the the, the water that was binding to the glycogen is being uh, being kicked out but if it's a hormonal thing, then there's not really that much. I was going to say that's the it. thing just that ride it out. drives yeah. my friends and me crazy. It's like you'll kind of go, "Was well, there anything I can eat to make this better, <laughs> yeah. or not? Or do I just yeah. accept it? Or is it exercise that will combat it? Because it, it is really. frustrating. You just yeah. have to suck it up. <laughs> just, just, just suck it up. Or, you know, <laughs> em- embrace it as well in some ways. Um, but 
obviously keeping hydrated you can keep it to a minimum and not going too mad with the salt and not going too mad with the carbs and all those kind of things can help, but you're always going to be fighting against the fact that it's hormonal fluctuation that is that's driving it as well. Oh, crikey. Oh, well, we tried on that one. Yes. And, and again, just before I finish, this, I'm asking on this series, all of my guests, what would be the one thing that they would add into our wellbeing capsule? It can be a product or it could be a food, but it comes highly recommended by you. Blimey. Uh, <laughs> wow, that's going to take some thought, actually. Um, coffee. Oh, really? <laughs> coffee. Yes. Go now, on. Right. I mean, not only does it it stop me being a, a complete ogre first thing in the morning, um, it's got some incredible health benefits. It helps to regulate blood sugar. Okay, so black coffee. We're not talking about like a double latte with 50, <laughs> 50 sugars and caramel. I was like, syrup. everybody's now yeah. going, yeah, I'll go get one of them. <laughs> yeah, black coffee, black coffee. Um, it helps to stabilize blood sugar levels. It actually helps to enhance cognitive function and it, it helps to protect cognitive health long term. It's incredibly rich in polyphenols, which support the health of the cardiovascular system and also gut bacteria. And it's incredibly, incredibly good for the liver. So, you know, if you do like a, a glass of wine or something, then coffee can be a really good ally at keeping your liver healthy. <sighs> Wow, I love that. That is amazing. <laughs> I'm so pleased with that. Oh, Dale, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you with me today always, and to hear all of your incredible advice and insight. My mind is like totally blown. Um, it's been brilliant. <laughs> I hope you guys at home have enjoyed our conversation and you found it helpful and informative too. If you'd like to find out more about Dale's brilliant programs and nutritional advice, then please visit www.dalepinnock.com or you can find him and his amazing advice and recipes on Instagram at The Medicinal Chef. For more well-being, fashion and beauty, you can catch us at our website, www.thecapsule.co.uk, where you can also catch up with our previous podcast episodes by visiting the In Conversation page and subscribing to any of our podcast channels and YouTube. It would be lovely to hear your thoughts, as always, about all of our episodes, so please feel free to leave your rates and reviews. If you're a social butterfly, you can also catch us on Facebook and Instagram, at Official Capsule. I will not be back next week because we're taking a little break because it's somebody's 40th birthday so we are going to have a week off next week and so but I will be back the week after that for more conversations of inspirations and so all that's left for us to say today is goodbye so it's goodbye from Dale see you later and goodbye from me this episode of the capsule in conversation was brought to you by Harrogate Springwater Bottled at source, Harrogate Spring offers a pure, refreshing taste with a delicate blend of naturally occurring minerals and electrolytes, perfect for healthy hydration.